There's a guy named Mike Matthews, eh? and he's gonna say a couple things on his podcast called Mike's Daily Podcast. Mike's Daily Podcast. That would be the name of the show. My name is Mike Matthews. This is FF episode. Mike's Daily Podcast. 2208, 2208. How are you doing? Are you great? That's good because I ate a little bit today. Mostly cereal type stuff. Yay. I have to eat something that's worthwhile that's got like vegetable matter in it. I guess that's the end of my song. It wasn't much of a song, was it? Hey, do you like that picture from Bolinas? Mike's Daily Podcast. Last Mike's Daily Podcast. Isn't it nice? It's got like uh, cypress trees. And I saw Mike's a lot of cypress trees Daily on my little trip. Podcast. My little vacation. Yeah. A week ago. So much fun. Just wow. Went to Point Reyes, Shoreline, Bolinas, Stinson Beach, oh, Point Reyes Station, and then all these little things along the side of Tamales Bay, the east side of that bay. There's all these little wharfs and restaurants and stuff. Oh, and Tamales, and what was that town? Oh, Dillon. Dillon Beach. Okay, here's the thing about Dillon. And we talked about Marshall, and we talked about Dillon last week. But Dillon Beach is kind of a, eh, it's a money pit. It's a money grab. They're grabbing money from you. A tourist, if you're a tourist, there's like no free parking. Everything's like 20 bucks to park. There, Everything is costly. It's like going to Disneyland or Disney World. I love watching all of these YouTube videos, YouTube channels about Disneyland, Disney World. I watch that Disney food blog video on YouTube and I do it because I know I'm not going to go. And people move heaven and earth to get to those resorts. Even during a pandemic, they'll, they have to abide by wearing the masks. In Florida, of course, the rules are a lot less strict. And here's today's podcast picture. Well, in California, they haven't even opened them yet, but apparently they're going to open Disney California Disney's California, but like you won't be able to ride any rides, which is ridiculous to me. Now, I went to an amusement park on my birthday, around my birthday in Vallejo at Discovery, Six Flags Discovery Kingdom. The rides weren't open, but all the animals, you could see all the animals and there weren't that many people and we're all social distancing and wearing masks. And it was a wonderful day. Got to see uh, seals, sea lions. Lions, lions, and bears, no bears, but wolves, giraffes, it was amazing. But the podcast picture is not of that. And Basil the Boxer is not in this picture either. But he and I went to many a beach together. Remember those days, Basil? Yeah, McClure's Beach, he and I never went there. But that is at the end of the peninsula. I'm looking it up on Google Maps, actually, the... Well, okay, Point Reyes National Seashore is what it is. And you you go through the town of Inverness if you leave Point Reyes Station and you head north and you end up at this beach. It's the last stop on this road. You literally, the road just ends and there's, uh, it, well, there's a little bit of a hike and like a little hike, like you're walking maybe a mile and you're at this beautiful beach and you can see a picture of it at mikesdailypodcast.com. You can also then drive crazy far down to the south, I guess it's the southwest point of Point Reyes National Seashore. And that's where that uh, lighthouse is. I'm not a fan. I went there years ago and I remember it blew my ears out because the wind is so strong. They take, they tell you to take some tissue and shove it in your ears or something to clear, keep your ears Protected Because the wind is just so strong uh, And it's amazing I mean I I suggest doing it at least once If you're in California If you're in the Bay Area Check it out at least once But I think it's closed right now anyway But if you It, it is right on the end of this cliff This precipice And you're looking out into the Pacific Ocean And that's pretty awesome 
So I want to just cover this real quick. I, I caught some of this on the radio. Some guy whining about how Biden is really strict with masks, how Gavin Newsom strict with masks and 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 he was just this guy I don't know his name I was waiting to hear his name but they didn't as a bad talk show host they did not say his name at the end of the interview just terrible this show but he was complaining that masks don't allow you to see the other person smile and he goes well when I'm walking my dog I can't smile at people, so I have to end up taking my hand and waving to them. Oh, you poor, poor man. Just the thing, have you noticed what people on the right are... First off, this should not even be a political discussion, mass. If if you are someone who has lost someone to the coronavirus... Anyone that argues against masks will forever be the enemy... I'm sorry people that Argue against masks There are people who have died From the coronavirus And you are saying How do you explain that to that person Whose, whose relative or friend or loved one has died That, that, that it's Masks are stupid Masks hide our smiles I have to lift my hand up and wave to someone Because they can't see my f- smile well, smile with your eyes Wave Yes I like the waving As a matter of fact I, I have walked Around my neighborhood The sidewalks are pretty small And you know I w- I'll wear my mask When I see somebody walking On the same side of the sidewalk And they're wearing their masks And you know Just out of a courtesy And it seems like We always end up waving No matter who this stranger is We, we wave Because we're We want to show some sort of Humanity um, Solidarity With each other So Just that, that People Arguing Against mass It boggles my mind Trump Even Said that he was wearing masks Remember at the beginning He said I don't have any issue with masks Oh he did You can look it up It's a fact so the people that argue against it And think it's some kind of conspiracy We're hiding our faces We're hiding our smiles It's a conspiracy against smiles Masks Really? That boggles my mind Sorry, some things in this world Just what is going on? Oh, yes And the complaint The complaints that are going on The whiny white men thing Going on Wine Well I like The whiny white man Wine list This is interesting Wow this is interesting Yes they're whiny white man Wine lists The list of things They whine about As we go outside a cafe Anyway where you're bringing Mike's Daily Podcast Somewhere in Podcastro Valley Ton Today And yes I am white And yes I am whining about things That people are whining about Which is meta and weird and strange and odd And I will stop But It's There was this clip that Seth Meyers played I don't know who this talk show host is I think he's on Newsmax And he was complaining about One of Joe Biden's dogs I mean the dogs are rescues He's complaining that one of them looks mangy and Seth Meyer said, uh, you know, you're criticizing a dog in a world where people are adopting, thankfully, adopting dogs left and right. I mean, you, you are not, you are not playing to the room when you are criticizing a dog. I mean, how low, how low is this going? It's ridiculous. It's politics and I should shut up. But hey. It, it, there's no reason for that No matter what side of the Political spectrum you fall on AMC Entertainment The nation's largest theater chain Said yesterday it's awarding CEO Adam Aaron And other executives Supplemental special incentive cash bonuses To recognize the challenge They faced Steering the embattled company On a financial roller coaster Over the past pandemic year Corporate associates and theater management will also get bonuses 
with all payouts coming from an authorized pot of $8.3 million. Today's SEC filing only requires the company to break out its top five executives. Aaron will receive $375 million. The company said the bonuses are, are recognize extraordinary efforts of employees to maintain the company's business and preserve stockholder value during the COVID-19 pandemic. When movie theaters closed last March, AMC's top executives, including Aaron, agreed to cut their cash salary by 15% and decrease other compensation over three years in exchange for stock that will only vest if the price doubles or triples. Aaron said he would lose $1.6 million as a result of the pay cut. With theaters dark, the company eventually had to furlough about 30,000 people and has been bringing them back on slowly as theaters reopen in parts of the country. AMC's problems have been among the most public and painful in the entertainment industry as revenue dried up and Aaron had to face high debt landlords and a pandemic that dragged on and on. The company negotiated leases and restructured its debt several times, raising just enough cash to keep Chapter 11 in the rearview mirror. This according to Yahoo Business. A successful financing in the winter gave it more runway and then segued into an unusual moment on Wall Street. Retail investors in Reddit chat rooms in late January became champions of AMC stock as a kind of Sidekick to GameStop Buying it aggressively That set off a cascade of events That helped significantly reduce debt Just as vaccines Rollouts And infection rates started to fall New York will be uh, New York City actually will begin Opening cinemas March 5th And some believe LA may not be far behind We mentioned that on a recent podcast Yes All right, well, maybe we shouldn't be going to the movies as much anyway Because movies, for the most part, are awful But maybe we should be reading more Yes That's what what I should be doing Oh, by the way, I got dinged again by stupid YouTube Yes, they age-restricted the content of my last show called Fries And I called it Fries is sort of a joke because all the fries stores closed, electronic stores. But I spelt it as like French fries. Oh, it says we haven't applied a strike to your channel, and your content is still live for some users on YouTube. Tube, <laughs> YouTube, because they're stupid. They age restricted the content though On my last podcast You should listen to it to try and find out why Because I have no idea why Uh, Let's see here There is a California coronavirus strain That perhaps you have heard of And by the way Have you been to my Twitter page At Mike Talks And don't forget tomorrow morning I will be on the radio There is a link at mikesdailypodcast.com And I will be on from 9am to 4pm Pacific time And it looks like Oh, there, there are these two bots on Twitter That always retweet my posts My podcast posts And that's Power Cut Music and Funny Quotes Bot And I would like to thank them And then Vince always likes to like my tweets And thank you Vince You're awesome Listen to Vince's podcast He's supposed to be bringing it back If he hasn't already I haven't checked to see if he has Vince in the Bay Is what it is But Anyway Cafe anyway Back to that story about um, The Scientists fear a nightmare scenario Where a patient is infected By two different coronavirus strains That swap mutations And become more dangerous This according to the LA Times As California sees a decline In COVID-19 cases There's a growing concern About another potential problem Waiting around the corner A new, more contagious Severe virus strain That can evade antibodies Generated by COVID-19 vaccines Or prior infection 
Hmm. Is that just a scare tactic or something true? I don't know, but I want to keep wearing my mask in a world like that. Texas tried to lower electricity prices by creating market competitions. By market by creating market competition, customers ended up paying billions more. Nearly 20 years ago, Texas shifted from using full service regulated utilities to generate power and deliver it to consumers. The state deregulated power generation, creating the system that failed during that freeze when temperatures plummeted last week. For the past 20 years, consumers in the state have paid more for their electricity, the Wall Street Journal discovered. And I used to think it was awesome that they had their own power grid because, you know, we had all these rolling blackouts in California. I thought maybe that's what we need. But as we see underneath the hood, not so good over there. Maybe not as green the grass on that side. How the pandemic helped first time buyers get into the market. That was something that got posted that apparently also then got deleted off of Twitter. So I don't know if that's an actual thing. It was a headline that appeared for a little bit. But yes, I know I, I've heard a lot of realtors say, oh, you know, it, people are still looking for houses. You can virtually look. They've adapted. Real estate industry has adapted to the pandemic. Last night, I helped produce a show, a religious show. And there's a pastor that was on. He's very well spoken. And he doesn't do that thing that I can't stand that pastors do where they do this thing where they ask what? They ask a question and then they answer it. In fact, <laughs> Dr. Robert Jeffers is pretty funny because he, he made light of that. He goes, I can do an interview with myself because I'm a pastor. I ask questions and then I answer them. It's true. If you go to a service, if you go to a sermon, you hear the pastor these days, the, the, the sermons that I've heard there or seen, they're always, and they do what they, and, and Jesus went to where? To Jerusalem. That's right. And he did what? He rose, the, whatever the passage he's speaking about, but that's what the pastor was talking about last night. Well, he wasn't asking questions and answering them to try and make sure the congregation hadn't fallen asleep. He was discussing about our world in which we have so many divisive, divisive things in our world. Race, politics, masks for crying out loud. And he tied it all back into the Bible and how God welcomes you no matter what race or politics you are and that you uh, you're, he, he loved you so much He put his son on the cross Only he said it you know In a pastor sort of way That sounded He just did it so well He's an older guy And in some ways It was saying You know don't look at the color of the skin God doesn't do that and There were all these little things he would say That said basically the same thing That we're all uh, every, everyone is The same in God's eyes And all of that And if you're religious or not The point is We shouldn't be so divisive at any rate And we should all try to get along As one guy said years ago Named Rodney King And we should also be reading Okay, so back to reading Back in 1920 A small company was born near Pittsburgh Dedicated to covering high school activities Today, the company known as Scholastic Remember seeing that? Scholastic? Uh, they publish family-oriented titles Such as Dogman, The Hunger Games Hunger Games is a family-oriented title Harry Potter uh, Some would say Harry Potter is not family Because it's got wizards in it And demons uh, but the person from Scholastic Entertainment, the chief strategy officer, was saying that their goal 
is the same today to provide kids with stories and information that open their hearts and expand their horizons to help them better understand and engage with the world around them, to inspire students to cultivate their minds and to help build a society free of prejudice and hate. Going back to that previous theme. Why have physical books endured? Uh, This person was asked, this chief strategy officer. Printed books provide unique benefits during the read aloud experience. Plus they don't need batteries. Well, unless you're using a Kindle or a tablet. With parents saying that children enjoy choosing the book themselves and that turning the page is a shared moment that both parent and children enjoy. At the end of the day, even in our screen-filled room and screen-filled world, kids just love the feeling of holding a book in their hands. The most important customer is the child. We know kids learn an immense amount from the books they read, so how we can draw them in and encourage their love of reading. We try to publish books with madcap adventures and belly laughs and wish fulfillment. Most of all, we want readers to see themselves reflected in the books we publish, their experiences, their worries, their cultures, their faces. We are always willing to take on issues, even if it draws criticism. Um, We're trying to We believe all children should be able to see themselves, their cultures, and their communities reflected in books. Uh, We've always been willing to take on issues and deal with the consequences and have done so on topics including race, global warming, gender identity, discrimination, gun safety, immigration, among others. That article I took out of the Costco connection, because Costco, I guess, is a big advocate for scholastic and reading is fundamental to most people creativity and loafing don't seem to go hand in hand but in fact they're strongly related writes E. Arthur Self PhD in his book Good Success Learning Good Lessons from Bad Leaders good leaders learn how to loaf creatively and productively Most bad leaders don't creatively loaf, they just loaf. Creative loafing is planned and productive idleness. Good leaders can draw substantial benefits from learning how to loaf creatively and productively. Bad leaders don't loaf creatively because they don't see the knowledge, insights, and understanding that the proper kind of loafing can provide. The history and etymology of the word loaf as you might expect, comes from the idea of mixing and kneading flour and various ingredients to make bread. Loafing is to form into portions or blocks to be baked. Yet another definition is to idle away time. After the Industrial Revolution, loafing became identified with non-productive time and non-productive people who are non-energetic, people who are idle, Produce nothing, but good leaders know that productive idleness exists and is highly useful. Some of the best managers leaders are se- have set aside time to loaf creatively because it sharpens their emotional intelligence and perception. It can also uh, deepen their knowledge about how people use and talk about the products and services their companies provide. Creative loafing is less sophisticated a less sophisticated form of observational research. Ethnography is a form of observational research in which researchers spend large amounts of time observing groups of people and identifying behaviors specific to each group. An organization might use ethnographic techniques to identify how potential customers spend their time, how lifestyle choices influence buying and product use, and how consumers access and consume services. The setting for the research may be the workplace, home, a leisure activity, or a variety of other locations such as shopping malls and airports. The author says, I try to often make the most of my time and sharpen my observation skills while waiting in airports. After the emails, texting, and phone calls have been done, 
And I don't want to read or write I attempt to guess the country of origin State of residence, vocation Primary motive in life State of mind or destination By observing the actions Attitudes and appearances of people Passing by This then provides the data upon which We might engage in conversation In many ways this is similar to the process Used during creative loafing Good leaders go out of their way To more creatively interpret the information they have Get new information from others And use what they have gathered to create productive engagements Loafing Maybe you should do some loafing today Speaking of which Look who's outside of Cafe Anyway Loafing around now Hi Mark It's Benita the Rodeo Queen How you all doing? And it's a disgruntled field player tell you what What? I hate wearing my mask, but I wear my mask because I don't want the world to see my smile Because I haven't been taking good care of my teeth lately Tell you what What? I should see a dentist And look who else is here Hello Mike, I make the delicious root beer house to run out It's made out of the coronavirus vaccine No, it's not Yeah, it is, drink it, I'll kill you It's not made a coronavirus vaccine. That's a lie. Take it back. Okay, I will. Bye. Bye, y'all. Bye. That's what Benita says. Yeah, it is. Bye, y'all. Bye. Okay, there they go. Thank you for joining us on this precipice of fun. Next show, it'll be the wonderful Madame Rutabaga, Valentino, and Bison Bentley. Tell me what you think. 336MM Daily. That's 3 plus 3 equals 6. MM is in Mike Matthews Daily is in what this podcast will try to be. Thanks for listening. Mike's Daily Podcast is written and produced and performed by Mike Matthews. His podcast is super easy to find. Download or listen to his show and read his blog at mikesdailypodcast.com. Email Mike now at mikesdailypodcast at gmail.com. See you tomorrow. Bye.